Um, it's nice to see so many people again. Apparently there are 13 people uh, watching online, which is a few less than last time, but there's far more in the hall this time. We were anxious about whether these hybrid meetings, how they would work out, but uh, we, I think we guessed and got it all wrong. We thought there'd be few people here and many more sitting in at home drinking wine, but there's only 13 at the moment. Uh, well, it's nice to see so many again. Uh, organising these hybrid meetings is not easy and it takes a lot of effort uh, uh, to do it. Um, now, I imagine that many of you are going to actually know or have heard of uh, tonight's uh, speaker, uh, Keith Broomfield. Um, and probably doesn't need any introduction, but uh, uh, he lives in Dollar and he contributes. Most people will know him because he contributes uh, the uh, wildlife column for the Alloa Advertiser and I think for the Dundee Courier, is it? Yeah, yeah. And Press and Journal. Oh, well, <laughs> famous. He's also a member of a number of local groups. I know him because he's uh, on the board of the Fourth Naturalist and Historian, uh, but he's also a trustee of the Fourth uh, Rivers Trust. And we've had a lot of talks from the Fourth Rivers Trust. They're a really important organization. Um, we've had talks on salmon going up the rivers. Had, they are in charge of getting rid of uh, uh, non-native uh, alien species like hogweed. I'm in the, their hogweed program and they're also uh, involved in uh, the flooding release programs which are, are taking place in the Upper Allen. So it's great that he's a trustee of that organization. He's also in the Angling Society and the Fourth Naturalist and Historian as I said. Now uh, Keith apparently was a graduate of zoology from the University of Aberdeen. But uh, his writing, as you'll hear about in a moment, covers virtually every element of the natural world, uh, from the flora and fungi to invertebrates, mammals, birds, and marine life. And I'm sure you're gonna hear about all of those tonight. He is very unusual, I think, as a naturalist, in that he often takes to the water in a wetsuit in the most unlikely places, I have to say as well. Again, we'll hear about it in the talk, I think. He's the author of two books. He's got his, uh, going to sell them if you want one them later on. Uh, the first book that I was aware of is If Rivers Could Sing, which is actually about, or well, the topic is about the River Devon, which is its topic this evening. But just recently, he's published another book, uh, A Scottish uh, Wildlife Odyssey, uh, In Search of Scotland. Secrets. Well, I have a habit of going on too long at these introductions and stealing the introduction of the speaker himself. So I'm going to turn over immediately uh, to Keith. Please welcome him. And while we wait, I think for the um, uh, for for the technology to be set up for those at home. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. No. Yeah. Told to land on this floorboard over here that's black. I'm just wondering why this one's black. Could be healthy. <laughs>
Hello? Can you all hear me? Yeah, is that working? Yeah, okay. Having trouble uh, putting this into my shirt, so I'll just, I'll just hold it uh, as I speak. So uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, it's great to see such a good turnout. So what I'm going to um, uh, uh, talk about is uh, a wildlife year on the River Devon. Uh, the River Devon, it's my local river. I moved to Clackmannanshire about um, 12, 13, actually probably even 14 years ago now, um, and instantly fell in love with the river. Um, and I think, you know, rivers, we all like rivers, don't we? They're very special places. They're very serene, very relaxing places. I was born in Edinburgh, and the first few years of my life, I lived on the south side of Edinburgh. I remember very clearly exploring uh, Colton Dell uh, on the water of Leith there and uh, finding my first Dunnock's Nest, uh, Asia Blue Eggs shining out at me. I still remember that as a, one of my first memories in life. And then later on, when I was about six or seven, the family moved to the north of Edinburgh near Leith. Uh, and I remember clearly going to uh, Warriston. There's a bridge, an old railway bridge overlooking the water of Leith. And I'd hang over there looking down into the water of Leith. And I'd see water bowls. So this had been about. Um, the late 1970s, and then water bowls were really common. And you could be guaranteed to look over this bridge and see water bowls, and you see kingfishers. And I remember finding eels and seeing elvers migrating out the river. So it was very exciting. I've always liked rivers. And then when I was slightly older, um, into my teens, had a bike, I would cycle to East Lothian, uh, go to Hamby Woods, which is near a small village called East Saltoon. And I remember exploring the River Tyne there. And again, you'd be wading in the water and I'd be seeing, finding dippers' nests and just all that kind of stuff, just all very, very exciting. And then after that, when I went to University of Aberdeen, uh, the River Dee became my home river and its tributaries. And I remember clearly, I mean, Roy mentioned about how I like to get into the water and going snorkeling. There's a place on the River Dee, it's a, a tributary uh, near Braemar, it's called the uh, Eye Water or Eye Burn maybe, which is really more a river. Um, that flows into the River Dee. And there's a place there that some of you might know, it's called the Colonel's Bed, and it's a deep, rocky gorge. And in August and September, the salmon, they come up the tributary, come up the high burn, and they lie in this gorge, just waiting for the first rains to come. And then when the rains come, uh, there's a very narrow passage above, um, and the salmon are just waiting for the, the waterfall to get into spades so they can rise and go up the final bit of the burn to their um, spawning beds, the, the gravel spawning beds. So, you know, one time I stripped off, got my snorkel mask on, dived in and swam in amongst the salmon. And it was incredible just seeing all these silvery fish um, swimming all around you like mini, mini torpedoes. So, so rivers are really sort of special places, um, just places that are, I find very attractive and just a wonderful place to relax. Uh, and obviously so full of wildlife. So I'm just going to talk about the, the River Devon. So it's, it's going to be a wildlife year in the River Devon. As Roy mentioned, um, I, I wrote a couple of years ago uh, a book on the wildlife year on the River Devon called If Rivers Could Sing. Um, and it was an exploration really from June 2019 to June 2020. So that was my river year. It wasn't uh, January to December year. It was a summer um, 2019 to summer 2020. So a lot of you might know uh, the Devon, it's, it's roughly uh, 33, 34 miles long. It's got a very strange course in a way, a very kind of inverted or a, a U in its side. It rises at 800 uh, feet on Alva Moss and Oakles, and then it uh, flows in an eastward direction. It fills the upper and lower, lower Glen Devon reservoirs, then down through Glen Devon, um, fills Castle Hill Reservoir, then down towards Crook of Devon in a southeasterly course, and then suddenly it takes this abrupt turn, hence the name Crook of Devon, uh, where suddenly from flowing in a southeasterly direction, it suddenly flows westwards um, down through the, the hillfoot villages uh, of Dollar, Tillicutri, Alva and Menstry. Now, I think it's, it's, uh, geologists think maybe at one time the River Devon actually flowed into Loch Leven, but because um, uh, that's the direction it was flowing into, but by a phenomenon known as river capture, um, and I don't understand these geological processes, but I think now where Rumbling Bridge is near Crook of Devon, the land shifted and the land fell, uh, and that captured the flow of the river and made it kind of flow in this different course, uh, hence the unusual course of the, of the river. So here's a typical scene, talking about how rivers are just great places to be. This is between Dollar and Tillicutri. 
Um, this is probably my favourite part of the river, I think. It's a very relaxing place to be in, uh, surrounded by the flood meadows, uh, uh, the Hoch, as it's known, which uh, re regularly floods. Um, when the river comes into spate, the water spills over uh, and floods these uh, uh, floodplains. Uh, and the floodplains are quite wild places. Um, they are used for grazing cattle, but there's lots of boggy bits that are uh, good for various types of birds, such as uh, snipe. So when I started um, my wildlife here on the River Devon um, um, exploring, I wanted to kind of see beavers, I find out more about the beavers that, that live there. Because um, I've been aware of their existence there for maybe for about the last 10 years. I think about maybe 10, 11 years ago, uh, a roadkill beaver was found uh, between Dollar and Tillacoutry. And there have been increasing signs on the river, uh, such as uh, this tree, this willow, uh, that, that's, that's been gnawed. Um, so, so numbers, you know, they were there, uh, they were increasing, um, and I wanted to kind of find out more about them and just, just how they were doing. Um, and I also begged the question, you know, how did beavers get to River Devon? Because the River Devon is on the fourth catchment, uh, and as uh, we all know, uh, most of the beavers in Scotland are on the Tay catchment system. So I don't suppose it's a, a question I actually know uh, the answer to. Um, I, have, I have two ideas. One, they might have come over from uh, Glen Eagles. There's the uh, Ruffin water and the watershed between the River Devon up in Glen Devon um, and that uh, Ruffin water is only like 500 yards wide. So possibly they could have come up that way and across. But I think more likely they came from the River Urn and they were first seen in the River Urn uh, about the year 2000. How they got there in the River Urn in the first place is open to debate, but probably they were an escape from a private collection, maybe. Um, uh, there, there is an animal farm uh, near Comrie, maybe that was the source of them. Um, and so they spread along the Urn at first. And I suspect they might have gone up to Loch Urn Head and then down into the Fort Catchment, down through Loch Lubneg, down River Teeth, uh, and down, down out the River Forth at Stirling. And sometimes if you watch ducks or gulls on the water, on the inner fourth estuary, when the tide is going out and the river's flowing, they whiz past their like um, water cars to go really fast. And I could see a, a, a beaver coming out the, the fourth estuary uh, at Stirling, going very fast down uh, the inner fourth estuary and would reach the River Devon very quickly and then could access the river that way. So I think that's probably the most likely uh, means of, of how they colonize the river. Now here's a, a beaver dam. Now, I have never seen a beaver dam on the River Devon. I don't think they actually use beaver dams. Uh, they don't actually make dams there because they've got no need to. Um, the beavers there, they live in the main body of the river and they make dams to control the water level. And, and the River Devon they don't need to. The water level's fine. There's plenty of trees and various bits for them uh, to feed on. So they don't actually need to, 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 to make dams. But here uh, is a dam uh, in Perthshire. This is near Dunkeld. I don't know if any of you know a place called uh, Mill Dam, a kind of appropriate name. It's, it's a loch um, on the Athol Estates. And this is the, uh, the burn is exiting the loch. And you can see the, the beavers have, have built the dam. And then you can see in the bottom right-hand side, uh, the water uh, still flowing out, uh, uh, creating the burn. And, and the flow is still continuing. So although the beaver has dammed the burn, it, it's not actually stopped it. It's just kind of slowing the flow. And then you'll see on the, uh, the, top, um, um, uh, the top side of the photograph there, how it's created this vast pool um, of water, which is great for biodiversity, great for, for insects, for, uh, great for invertebrates, amphibians, water plants. So it's created this new area. And for the beaver, that's good news because it's created more areas where it can forage. Beavers really don't like being out, out of water. They feel safe in water. So it gives them a greater area uh, uh, where they can forage. Uh, but as I say, never um, seen a dam yet on River Devon. Uh, and if they do build a dam, it would be on a tributary such as this, uh, maybe one of the kind of smaller ditches that they might build a dam. And of course, you know, the biodiversity that they, cre the, they create, um, there are all kinds of environmental benefits that, that they do, um, which is great. And of course, I mean, not everything's rosy. Beavers are controversial animals. A lot of landowners don't like beavers. Uh, they can block drainage ditches and uh, cause flooding sometimes. Um, they don't like uh, farmers to let their trees get felled. Um, so there are management issues. And of course, in 2019, uh, beavers were afforded a degree of protection in Scotland. Um, although that still allowed for um, uh, uh, what I think um, Scott Nature calls or Nature Scott calls, um, you know, kind of um, last ditch solutions. We can still cull 
beavers, you can still uh, kill the animals as a means of control. But of course, that didn't really happen in a way, because uh, even after 2019, a lot of beavers were still getting killed. I think in the first year, almost a fifth of the population, um, 90 animals were getting killed in the first year. And in 2021, I think roughly 90 animals were killed as well. Overall, about 120 animals were captured that were deemed to be causing problems. Uh, uh, 87, I think, were uh, killed, euthanized uh, in the end, and the balance, 33, were translocated to other, other areas. So they are controversial animals, but you know, beavers, they belong here. They're, they're, they're native to Scotland, they're native to Britain. So they're animals that we need to protect. They deserve our protection and uh, we should be doing so. So I kind of think, you know, in this kind of modern day world, uh, yes, beavers can cause land use issues, but I think, you know, we've got to be thinking of ways of living with beavers and uh, mitigating their impacts rather than sort of taking the, the lethal solution. So when I was first looking for the beavers, so this has been about uh, end of June uh, 2019, the River Devon, it's, it's, it's a spate river. Uh, the levels, they rise and fall uh, quite a lot. So after heavy rainfall, you can get uh, um, uh, a, a major rise in the river and it'll spill over into the floodplain. So one afternoon when I was uh, uh, researching my book, this is the, down near Alva, and you can see the water rising, it's rising really fast. And there were sand martins, there were young sand martins in their burrows, and they're just about ready to fly, not quite, so they're just almost there. And you can see them as a panic in their faces. They looked at their burrows, they could see the water rising. Uh, and then I began to see some of them were actually crawling up the, the sand, up from their nesting sites to escape the rising water. Uh, and this is one of them. Um, it's virtually a day from flying, uh, just very, very close and probably can even take short flights um, in, in that picture. But these sand martins were desperately escaping the rising water. Uh, and it's, you know, it's quite an emotional thing to see. And it kind of just shows you know, some of the dangers that river birds, river creatures face, not just from uh, predators, but you know, from the climate, from the weather. Um, it's a very challenging environment. Here's one sand martin, a young baby sand martin that was uh, teaching precariously on the edge of the bank. So I, I picked it up and just kind of moved it just a few feet in from the, the bank edge uh, where his parents could still find it and it could hide safely um, until it probably ready to fly the next day. I quite like this photo because it kind of shows, you know, what a large eye a sand martin has. You don't really appreciate that, I don't think, when you see a sand martin flying around. But obviously because they are insect feeding birds, they've got to have great eyesight to, to, uh, to see insects. So a really beautiful birds, uh, one of our first uh, first migrant arrivals. So you, you see the first birds maybe in the middle of March, towards the end of March. So um, the book, My Wildlife Year in the River, it was obviously uh, doing a month-to-month -month, uh, catalog of our river wildlife year. But also I was doing a journey from the source all the way down to uh, uh, the sea, down to the estuary at Canvas. Uh, where it comes out into the inner fourth estuary. So here is the source. It's on Alva Moss, uh, 1800 feet, so quite high up. Some people might describe Alva Moss, as, so this is the Nocos, some people might describe Alva Moss as a quite a bleak habitat, but it is in a way. It's not really that natural, you know, it's, it's heavily grazed by sheep, lots of peat hags, uh, uh, so it's so quite a windswept, quite a um, remote, uh, wild environment. Bit compelling as well, I mean, it's, it's, it is a compelling, you know, with the bog cotton there, it's, it's quite an attractive place. So I was keen to, uh, a bit like David Livingston or something, but they let that, I was keen to find the source of the, the, the River Devon, uh, and here it is. Uh, and it's a sphagnum muddy pool. Um, and in fact, there's a few muddy pools, peat pools around this on, on the summit. Um, and I reckon this was the, the biggest one I could find, the, the furthest up. So this was more or less the source. And of course, you know, it's very underwhelming, isn't it? Uh, but then the source of all rivers is underwhelming. You know, the Nile, Amazon, Tay, the Tweed. Every river starts as a mere seepage in the environment. You know, just, 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 enough, just a puddle, a pool, a trickle of water. In Alva Moss, it's like a big sponge just full of, you know, millions and millions of litres of, of water that eventually forms a pool and with gravity that pool will turn into a tumbling burn. So this was like, a, you know, it's, it's the birth of a river we're seeing here. 
uh, something very small that will gather momentum like a snowball rolling down the slope uh, and could become something really exciting and, and something interesting, just, you know, dynamic and so full of life. And you just had to go, this is like literally, I don't know, 200 yards down from where that picture was taken off the pool. And the river, uh, which is called the, uh, the Finn Glen Burn at the stage of the, of the River Devon, it's an early uh, tributary, uh, early source stage. Um, and already the pools there were showing life. You know, here's a back swimmer, a water boatman uh, in, in one of the pools. So there's invertebrates there. If you put your hands in and scooped it out, scooped it out the, the gravel, there'd be mayfly nymphs uh, and other small creatures. So life was already, you know, kind of developing in, in the river uh, just from, you know, basically 100 yards, 200 yards fr uh, from the source. So it's, it's really uh, uh, quite an exciting feeling. And I remember seeing a grey wagtail flying overhead uh, and that would be feeding on, the, on these invertebrates and maybe it had a nest nearby. Now, I, I searched this part of the, the Finn Glen Burn, Finn Glen Burn um, uh, which is, so it lies above the Upper Glen Devon Reservoir for brown trout. I couldn't see any brown trout, I couldn't find any brown trout there, but I'm pretty sure they exist. And if you go to other high burns and ochles, uh, particularly the Burn of Sorrow, so the Burn of Sorrow lies above Dollar. I don't know if you know Dollar Glen, and there's the Cast Castle Campbell, and, and there's these kind of huge um, uh, waterfalls and gorges, which are totally impassable to fish. But if you go above the highest waterfall, above uh, Castle Campbell, and you look in the Burn of Sorrow that runs through the Glen, uh, 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 the Glen of Sorrow, you'll find brown trout. And they're small, they're only about six inches long, but they're sexually mature, they breed, uh, so it's like a population of miniature trout, self-sustaining population. And the question is, how did they get there? Well, of course, they might have been introduced. Maybe inhabitants of Castle Campbell in times long past um, introduced trout there, or perhaps kids had caught trout in the River Devon and taken them off in a pail and just released them, and they, they became a self-sustaining population. I don't know, but... I did ask a freshwater uh, fisheries bi uh, biologist that, that very question, because you find these populations of trout all over Scotland, up in the Cairngorms, I know remote tarns and remote burns, we get these uh, small trout that are totally cut off from the rest of our river system. So they're, they're kind of isolated, self-sustaining. Um, and he told me, he thought they're, they're probably, you know, from the last ice age, when they're, um, they're, the landscape was very different. So, at, towards the end of the ice age, there were still ice lakes around, uh, which enabled trout to access high and remote waters that they can't uh, uh, obviously access now. So, there is a possibility um, that trout, such as these ones in the high burns and ochles, and certainly the trout in the, the high burns of the Cairngorms, uh, um, are, are, kind of, are relic populations that have been there for uh, thousands of years and are, you know, Genetic, genetically unique and, you know, uh, deserving uh, of, of conservation. Uh, it's a very interesting topic, I think, for further study. So this is the Upper Glen Devon Reservoir. So already, so this is maybe about sort of a mile, two miles from the source. And already humanity, we've changed the, the burn. <laughs> you know, the, the small burn is now a big reservoir, uh, a, 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 a huge loch. Um, very picturesque reservoir, a lovely spot to be. You'll get ospreys fishing there in the, in the summer. Um, and, you know, and the whole kind of catchment area here of, of the Devon has been transformed into reservoirs. There's Glen Sherrett Reservoir, which is a bit further downstream in one of the offshoot glens. It was built around 1880. Um, Upper Glen Devon Reservoir was built around the 1950s. The Lower Glen Devon Reservoir below it, um, that was built uh, towards the end of the First World War and into the 1920s and actually used uh, German prisoners of war for the First World War uh, to help build the dam there. And the, the reservoir was one of the reasons why it was made was to supply water to Resyth, to the, to the naval base. So, you know, dams, you know, there's a problem, problems in rivers all over the world, but in the Devon, you know, it's, uh, um, there's more natural obstacles further downstream, so it doesn't really affect migra migratory fish such as salmon or sea trout, because there's the natural obstacles of Rumbling Bridge and the Cauldron Lynn. Um, and in some ways, you know, it's good. Um, the fact that we're, we're using the river for water means we need rivers. Uh, we do need rivers. And if we need rivers, we need rivers for water or for power or, or for transport, whatever reason, then we're much more likely, I think, to look after them. So, so there's, you know, there's good sides to it uh, um, uh, as well. One 
area I find is often neglected in wildlife writing, um, and that's on invertebrates. I mean, they're not really very sexy. You're, you know, it's kind of it's more the birds and the mammals that, that people write about. Um, BAMs are very passionate about the invertebrates, the kind of small bugs, uh, the, the life. And in my book, I describe them as the river's engine room, and they really are the engine room of the river, that they are so, so important. Now, I'm a member of the Devon Angling Association, and one of the things that we do is we regularly monitor the river for invertebrate life. And this is a process uh, called uh, kick sampling. It's very rudimentary, um, very easy. So um, the guy on, on the left there, uh, uh, Bob Wright, a member of the association, he's uh, kicking the, uh, the gravel on the bottom uh, with his waders. He's got a net and um, he's, he's catching all the detritus that comes up and that includes invertebrates. Um, there's Amy Ferguson on the far right of the Fourth Rivers Trust um, uh, watching on. And um, we then monitor uh, the river on a regular basis for changes in vertebrate populations. So it's a good way, you know, where local people, local communities can get involved in their local river. And um, a lot of these invertebrates are indicator species. So, you know, if you can detect tra uh, trends or see some species are declining, then perhaps you can be, be working out, well, maybe not so well with the river. And all this is fed into national databases. This happens in, in lots of rivers uh, around the UK. It's fed into a, a, a database um, and it's called the River Fly Monitoring Initiative. So it's a great way where people can uh, get involved and uh, monitor life in the river, such as the River Devon. And it's great, you know, when you empty the net, you, you, you empty it into a, 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 like a collection tray. And at first you see nothing, it's all ooh, just a lot of mud and gravel and all that kind of stuff. And then suddenly it all comes to life and there's wriggling beasties everywhere. There's mayfly nymphs and uh, here's a, a stonefly. Um, this is a good one to catch because stoneflies like uh, pure, they like clean water. So if you're catching a good number of stoneflies, then that's a good sign that uh, all is, 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 is well with, with the river. Quite a prehistoric looking beastie, you know, um, um, an avid uh, a predator. Um, but still, I mean, trout will eat them. Although it's got that kind of armoured uh, skin, I don't think that will deter uh, any trout. Um, and of course, the trouts are eaten by otters and kingfishers and herons. So it's, again, you know, it's a food chain. Uh, this is why these guys are so important. And a, a mayfly or an olive, as anglers like to call them uh, on, on my glasses there. Um, incredibly beautiful insects. And you'll see them on a summer evening in many parts of Devon, as you will in any river, dancing up and down in their courtship dances uh, before the female females then lay eggs into the river. And of course, you know, the vertebrates, uh, some of the birds they support, for, for example, dippers, a uh, very good population of dippers in the River Devon. Uh, they're, they're doing very well. And, you know, what a great uh, adaptation Mother Nature has made for the dipper. You know, in the hardest winter, middle of winter, or Blackbirds and song thrushes are suffering like mad because the ground is frosted hard and they can't dig for worms and, um, and other creatures. Whereas a dipper just dives underwater and there's plenty of stuff there for them to feed on and the river will never ice over because it's always, always flowing. Um, so, river, uh, so, so dippers are doing really well on the, on the Devon. They always have done so. The only, only time they might struggle is when the river gets into spate and it gets very high and muddy. But then they have a strategy where they tend to move up the sideburns and they'll hang around the sideburns for a few days uh, where the water is a bit easier for them, a bit more benign, uh, where they can hunt and, and forage in pools. So another sampling that's done on the river. So this is all part of my river wildlife year as well. I think we're stopped coming into maybe August by this stage. And it's electrofishing. Now, electrofishing is much more fun than putting a Nambi Pambi net into the, into water or or angling with, uh, with a fly line because you're actually zapping the animals. Uh, um, but, it's, it's, but it's all done uh, in the best possible taste. Um, the animals are not harmed. So what happens here? Here is uh, Joe Gervin of the uh, Dr. Joe Gervin of the Fourth Rivers Trust, and she's sweeping in an anode in front of her. She's got a, a, a backpack and uh, with a battery in, in her back. Uh, and the anodes, uh, as she sweeps it, it temporarily stuns fish and, uh, um, uh, well, of course it will stun other creatures, but it's, it's fish we're really sort of looking for. So it'll temporarily stun trout and uh, minnows and other types of fish, young salmon, uh, and they just very briefly float to the surface when they're stunned, and then they're scooped up by the guy here in the uh, kind of reddish jacket, and then they're collected in a... Um, um, uh, a collection pail, uh, and then they are measured, analysed, recorded, and then released back into the, the river, uh, totally unharmed. This is on the, the, the dollar burn. 
So like the invertebrate monitoring, it's a great way to assess you know, how well our trout and salmon populations are doing, which burns are good spawning sites, which burns are, are less so. And perhaps if a burn is a, a, a less good spawning site, maybe there's action we can take to um, plant some trees, for example, to provide more invertebrates to make it a better place for uh, fish to live. And it's incredible. I mean, this is like a 40 foot stretch of river, I think. So we went up for about 15 minutes covering this, this 40 foot stretch. And we caught maybe 40 young trouts and five or six salmon par. Um, and you don't see them when you look and all you see is a tumbling bird and you think, oh, there's not much there. But it's absolutely full, uh, bristling full of life, including eels. So, uh, we caught this eel and a uh, fish that was. Quite common when a lot of us were uh, were young when we were children, but now classified as critically endangered, and uh, you know a very mysterious fish, a fish that for you know since the dawn of times caused a lot of head scratching. You know where do eels go? Where do they spawn? How do they breed? And so in the last hundred years or so, it, um, scientists have deduced that they spawn in the Sargasso Sea, off the Caribbean, off off the east coast of the USA. Um, and then the, the eggs will hatch and the young eels, the glass larvae, will float back on the North Atlantic drift on, on the Gulf Stream and they'll send the rivers maybe about two years later, um, still as uh, glass eels as, as are known, then they change into elvers and then um, could stay in the river for up to 20 years uh, before they then make the return journey uh, back to the Sargasso Sea. Um, absolutely in incredible creatures. I think it was Pliny the Elder thought uh, eels arose from putrefying mud. I think that's, that's how he, he, he put it. Um, but that was as good a theory as any. I mean, you know, um, they're such mysterious creatures. And the reasons for their decline, very popular to eat in a lot of Europe and, and Germany and, and Holland, places like that. So overfishing could be uh, one issue. Um, uh, could be weirs, dams impeding their migration, and of course climate change could be uh, impacting uh, things. For example, climate change if it's impacting upon the, the Gulf Stream and North Atlantic Drift, then that's going to affect their chances of uh, getting back to Europe uh, from their spawning grounds. So as Roy mentioned, uh, I like to do a bit of snorkeling, I like to get into the water. Um, I do a lot of snorkeling in the sea. Um, but, you know, a river, I haven't really snorkeled much in a river. So that like, seemed like a tremendously exciting thing to do. So during this, this would be sort of end of August now, during my river wildlife year, on the old um, uh, uh, wetsuit, um, face mask, snorkel into the river. And, you know, you'd be. It's a great way of getting close to the river. Really, like even when you're fishing, when you're wearing wearing waders, uh, just being part of the river is just such a good feeling, um, and even better feeling, I think, when you're actually swimming in it and, and, and part of it. And you know, when you surface, you get sights like this. You know, water crow foots, really beautiful, attractive uh, um, um, flower, uh, which is a, a member of the buttercup family, I think. Um, and you know, just great. So look at the, the adaptations. You know, the, the kind of flat floating leaves. Uh, so that it can float, so the plant can be supported, the flowers can be supported on the surface, surface of the water. But then stick your head under, and even more remarkable, because this is the, the water crow foot leaves under the water. So as you remember before, they were flat and floating. Now they're kind of thin, tassel-like leaves. And, you know, a great adap adaptation, um, you know, to kind of prevent the water crow foot from getting plucked from the, uh, the riverbed by uh, the surging current, because the, the thin leaves reduces the resistance. So a very, very clever uh, way of how the plant is adapted to live in rivers. So this was, uh, this is up near uh, Muckert's part of the river and the stretch of the river called uh, Fossaway. Uh, I remember uh, very water there, uh, very nice. I remember snorkeling there uh, with a mountain vertebrate, especially small snails that were living there, um, and there were fish sheltering. It's a, a sheltering in amongst the uh, the water crow foot. And there, there, therein lies another secret uh, beauty of the river: the stickleback. You know, a humble fish. Many of us would have caught as kids in, in nets and local ponds and places like that. But it's like an underwater peacock because in the spring the male gets this fantastic vibrant color about him he, he, he turns red and he struts around underwater like a peacock um trying to attract a mate uh, and he, he builds a nest for her he builds a nest from bits of detritus uh, and he'll lure and attract the female into the nest she'll lay her eggs he'll then chase the female away and then he'll guard the nest uh, and even uh, protect the young for the first couple of days after hatching 
So, you know, it's just all these kind of great um, secrets, if you like, happening in our rivers that you don't really see when you're just simply walking on a riverbank. So this picture is a bit blurry, so, so apologies for that, because this was taken underwater um, down towards Alva. So that's um, uh, the middle stretch of the River Devon. And in that part of the river, it, it turns more into a canal. It's very kind of slow moving. And as you can see there, a lot of sediment. And in fact, when I, um, so when snorkeling there, if, if you punch your fist into the, the sediment, the mud in the bottom, it would go all the way up to your, your shoulder. I mean, it was really, really thick uh, stuff uh, that, that built up over the years. And you see bubbles of gas arising from all the decomposition processes that were going on. So these here, the, these are minnows, uh, hugely abundant. There are a lot of them there. And we tend to think of salmon, we think of trout. You know, they're the king of the river. They're the main fish of the river. But in the Devon, I'd, I'd beg to differ. It's the, the minnow to me, because they are uh, in present in huge, huge numbers. And these will be the, uh, the prey of the, of the goosanders, of the kingfishers, uh, otters will, uh, will, will take them. So a very important uh, uh, prey species um, for kind of uh, uh, higher up predators on, on the river. And as I say, there are huge numbers of them. And what also struck me was when you're stroking around there in the banks, there's the, the fallen trees and the tree roots that are lying there. And they act like underwater reefs. So just as how a reef at sea will be brimming full of fish, then these underwater reefs of alder roots and tumbled uh, birches and other trees um, offers protective environment for a fish. And it wasn't that long ago when fishery managers, if, if a, a, a tree fell into a river, oh, that's not good. You know, an angling association say, that's not good. You know, let's remove the tree. It's a bad thing. But no, no, you know, trees are great. They've been falling in rivers since the dawn of time. And that's what rivers need. And for example, in, in the Allen Water, and I think someone um, mentioned the Allen Water scheme uh, at, at the start with the Forest Rivers Trust, they're actually dumping uh, dead trees into the river to, to help alter the flow, uh, slow the flow, make it more natural, so the river can adopt a more a natural meandering course. Um, um, and that's how it should be. And of course, the, the, the dead wood is uh, providing homes for invertebrates and uh, um, creatures like that, which also uh, aids and benefits the river. So it's a very, very important trees, uh, both living and when they're, they're dead. So moving on in my, my river year, and this, I was writing a chapter about invasive species, um, big, big problem on the River Devon, big problem on many rivers. This is Himalayan balsam, uh, one of the worst ones, you know, an ornament, ornamental plant from Vic, uh, Victorian times. Victorians liked it in their gardens. Came naturalized very quickly uh, and it spreads like wire, wildfire. It, you know, it, it, the seed pods, when it, when it dries, it can fire the seeds a, a reasonable distance. The seeds float. So whenever a river uh, goes into spate or, or, or whatever, uh, the seeds will get carried down the river and, and, and colonize new areas. And of course, it's a very tall growing plant. It will shade out native species. Um, and then because it shades out native species, when the, when the Himalayan balsam dies back in the autumn, the ground is bare and it's more liable to erosion. So um, not a good plant to have, have at all. And one invasive that I've noticed just in the last couple of years that's coming a real problem in the River Devon is the Japanese knotweed. Wasn't really a problem, I don't think, 10 years ago, but now it's absolutely everywhere, and that's really spreading quickly. So the Fourth Rivers Trust and the Devon, Ang in fact, the Devon Ang Angling Association has put in an application uh, this year, supported by the Fourth Rivers Trust and the District Fisheries Board, to um, have a, a, a knotweed control programme. So they apply for grant funding for that, so hopefully that will come to fruition, and maybe some work can be done next year to control the knotweed. Other invasives, the American mink, um, you know, undeniably a very uh, a bit of a cutie, you know, a very attractive creature, isn't it? Uh, lovely animal, um, but so um, such a versatile predator. Of course, and, and mink, they arrived in rivers um, in, in the UK and Scotland in the 1950s. They were farmed for their fur and animals inevitably escaped and became established. I mentioned, you know, when I was a kid on the, the River Tyne in East Lothian, um, and I found my first mink then, so that was like you know, 30, 40 um, years ago. So, so mink can be, can be getting, getting established uh, quite quickly. And this animal, amazingly, is 15 feet up a tree. So it has seen me coming along River Devon with my dog, uh, ooh, panic, up the tree. So it can climb a tree like a pine marten. It can 
dive underwater, swim like an otter, catching salmon and trout. So potentially it could take birds' eggs if it wanted to, um, and they'll take sandpipers' eggs um, by the river. They, they, they can burrow into sand martin nests and take their eggs and their chicks. So, you know, quite a serious problem having these guys around. Not their fault they're here, it's, it's, it's our fault. Um, and so, you know, they are, they are a big problem um, affecting the natural um, balance, natural equilibrium of things. It would be great to have a control program on them, but if you're going to do it, there's no point just doing it on one river, like the River Devon. You'd have to take it by an area basis, and they've been doing that in the northeast of Scotland, for example. Um, so if you can eradicate it from many areas, and, and, and uh, that will be give the most benefit. If you just eradicate them from the River Devon, they'll recolonize it in a matter of uh, years. So it's really got to be done on a, a big wide scale, uh, widespread scale, I think, to, um, uh, to control them. So like the big explorer, you know, uh, um, I was keen to kind of go, go down the River Devon and find out more of the sort of inaccessible parts. So despite the river being you know, flowing through a very popular part of Scotland, you know, it flows close to Alloa and uh, uh, places like that and Menstry uh, and flows past the Hillfruits villages. A lot of the river is quite inaccessible because a farmland comes down to it, for example, there's no paths there. Uh, so a great way was obviously snorkeling, swimming is one way, but take a, a canoe is another way. So a friend of mine uh, who's a canoe instructor at Alva, she uh, uh, kindly agreed to take me down the river. So we went down from Alva all the way down to Canvas in, uh, in a canoe. And it's a great fun way. I mean, it's a really good fun way of exploring nature. And it's also a way I wanted to find out more about the beavers there, because you could cover a lot of ground in a very uh, short uh, uh, time and hopefully you, know, you can assess you know what kind of beaver signs there were which I didn't actually see many um, although that was back in uh, 2019 but you saw great stuff like kingfishers uh, they've got they're having a good year in the river Devon uh, lovely birds so it's just uh, it, was, it was a great way of exploring the river and finding out more about it and one thing that did strike me was the amount of Himalayan balsam when you got down the lower reaches towards Menstrie it was everywhere it's absolutely rife so I mentioned the kingfisher. So this is a kingfisher at a nest uh, near Tillicoutry. I didn't take this photograph. I'm not uh, a particularly good photographer, but this is my friend Dave Taylor took this, this snap. Um, you got a special license to take kingfishers uh, at our nest near Tillicoutry a, a few years ago. So there's a kingfisher entering the, the nesting burrow. Lovely birds. And here's the, the, the male kingfisher. Male and kingfishers are very similar, but the male's got a kind of heavier, darker beak. They've had a great year at River Devon this year. There hasn't been much rainfall, uh, so the water's been very clear from the sea fish. I think when the water lowers, there's lots of pools um, uh, get created and lots of very slow moving parts of water. So it really benefited the kingfishers. And every time I go down to the River Devon, I'll see a kingfisher, um, you know, uh, they're doing really well. But they are vulnerable birds. They, they don't like uh, very cold winters. But they're, they're, they, they breed, um, um, they've got, got high reproductive rates. So in years when the populations crash, they can normally build back their numbers uh, fairly quickly. Love this photograph. This is uh, the female kingfisher on the right. See how it's got you know, slightly smaller, more slender, uh, not, such a, not such a dark bill, uh, feeding on the youngsters. So again, this is um, uh, by Tillicutri. Uh, a great photograph that. And see how the fish is presented head first so that the spines and the any spines on the, the fins or on the gill covers don't get caught in the, the, the gullet of the, the young kingfisher. So, so again, um, into maybe October, October, my wildlife year now on, on the River Devon. Uh, still haven't really seen any beavers, but I've been putting out camera traps and I was beginning to get film of some. Uh, here's one near Alva. You know, it just looks like a, a big guinea pig, doesn't it? And just uh, up on the hind legs, uh, chew, chewing away um, on, on the willow. Quite interesting. Um, that tree obviously fell eventually, but it wasn't a, a, an habitual returner, this beaver. It would have a gnaw one evening and then would come back for two or three nights and have another gnaw. Uh, and then eventually uh, the tree would tumble. I do always wonder how beavers choose which trees to, to gnaw. This is to kind of... Do they work it out or do they choose it at random? I'm never sure because sometimes they choose the strangest trees, but uh, um, and, and often what they'll try and like to do is, is to fell it into if they can, if they can fell a tree, um, a willow or whatever, um, into, into the river, um, then they can feed on its twigs and its leaves safely from within the water. So, that, so that's actually the aim if, if they can is to kind of get a tree in, in, into the water uh, where they can feed in safety. 
So now we're moving into November, um, and this chapter in my book is called uh, The Miracle of Salmon. And salmon are a miracle. This is um, just to show, kind of show you the difference between a, a, a young brown trout and a salmon par. So this, this was caught in the Dollar Burn. Uh, uh, you, you saw the picture um, when we were electrofishing in the Dollar Burn. And you can see the trout at the top. Uh, roughly the same age, but a lot chunkier and bigger and fatter, and you know, um, where, whereas the, the salmon par is a slender, uh, quite a fragile wee, wee thing, um, and it's strange to think, you know, like in just a year or two's time, it'll be a massive. That trout might be one or two pounds in weight, but that salmon might be five or six pounds in weight because it's migrated to the sea and um, had the chance to feed on its rich marine feeding grounds off Greenland and um, places like that. So this picture, again, this was taken uh, by Dave Taylor. This is at Dollar Weir, and there's a weir there. Uh, weirs are one of the, you know, the legacies of our industrial past, uh, cause all kinds of problems. And of course, the weir at, um, at, at Dollar, and there's another weir at uh, Canvas, uh, cause you know, big problems for, for migrating fish. I'm not sure the weir at Canvas is, is, a, is a massive problem for salmon, because they tend to wait until the, you know, the water is um, almost a very high tide, and it doesn't take much for them to get up. But, but the weir at, um, at uh, a dollar is a bit more of a problem. And of all the years of, of what salmon trying to negotiate the weir, I've never seen one get up, but they obviously do, because the anglers catch them upstream, and the dollar burns is upstream, and you catch some you know, young salmon electrofishing. But you know that picture just epitomizes the power of salmon. You can just see it all there, you know, fueled by the hormones to, to get up to the, the, the breeding grounds. And salmon, they're not doing that well. The Devon is, is classed as a, a category three river, which means um, anglers that catch salmon uh, on the river, they've got to uh, return uh, alive back to the water. And angling returns of salmon are not very good. So, I mean, last year, I think 10 records were caught maybe five, six, seven years ago, 40 were getting caught. This year, the conditions of the river have been quite good. So I think maybe 15 have been caught. I haven't seen the, the final figures. Um, so they're not doing that well. And all kinds of reasons for that. Probably climate change is, is a major reason. Driving some kind of effect in the oceanic breeding grounds. Salmon from Scotland, they'll, they'll feed off Greenland. It goes as far as uh, um, Baffin Islands uh, of, of, of Canada, a part of Canada. So they, they go a massive distance. And perhaps climate change is affecting the distribution of, of, of capelin and other small fish that, that they feed on in, the, in these waters. And that's affecting numbers. But also emphasizes you know, why conservation um, work in rivers is really important. Okay, the salmon are suffering all these difficulties, but if we can make rivers better places for them to spawn by removing weirs, for example, um, making sure um, planted trees for so that can drip insects into the water to, to feed young fish, all that helps, and that can will so maybe help mitigate the, the bigger problems that are happening on a wider, more global scale. And the salmon, the trouts, the, the, the river lampreys and the uh, sea trout, um, they can only get so far out of the River Devon because there's the, the Cauldron Lynn. So this is a natural waterfall. It's a magnificent two-tiered waterfall. It lies about a kilometre uh, downstream from Rumbling Bridge, which you probably all know quite well. Um, you know, there's a nice walk at Rumbling Bridge, very spectacular gorge. But to, to me, the, the Colin Lindsay is even more spectacular. It's very remote. It's a really, really hard place to get to. Um, so it's, it's a good um, uh, hour's hoof up through woodlands, uh, or you can come down from Powell Mill, for example. Um, but it's a, it's a difficult walk. There's crazy cows and fields you've got to get past and all that kind of stuff. So, so it's a very, and very steep banks to get down. So a very, very hard place to, uh, to get to. And one guidebook in the 19th century called it one of the most sublime places in Scotland. Um, and, you know, the guidebook was right. And if that was an accessible place, I think that'd be a really popular tourist attraction. But actually, I'm glad it's not because it's just a wonderful place to be. If you spend all that effort to get there, it's, it's just a fantastic place to, to sit and to watch the water tumbling down. And you can see all the liverworts uh, uh, on the side there, um, uh, just a, a wonderful place. And that downstream from there flows the Devon Gorge, parts of which is a, a triple SI. There's um, ash woodland there, for example, uh, and a very lonely, very wild woodland, uh, a great place to wander. No proper paths, you know, you've just got to, uh, as I say, hoof it and slide down steep banks in your bottom and stuff like that. So a, a, a good fun 
fun place to visit. So that's as far up as the salmon and, and the sea trout can, can get in the river. And red squirrels, uh, typical creature that you get in, in the Devon Gorge. Um, and red squirrels are doing uh, quite well in clam answer just now, possibly because uh, pine martens are moving into the area uh, and predating upon uh, greys who outcompete the, the red squirrels. So I mentioned at the beginning of the talk how the, the River Devon is a spate river and it will uh, spill over onto the floodplain, onto the Hoch. And that's a really exciting time. Um, so this will be moving on to about November in my book, in, in my wildlife year. And the chapter, of, I think it's called uh, uh, Death Death for Some and Opportunities Opportunities for Others. And so a tremendously exciting time when you can see the river spilling over onto, onto the floodplain. And you'll see there'll be gulls and there's herons and there's magpies and there's there's crows and they're all milling around in a crazy fashion. And why? Well, because there's there's worms are coming to the surface from rising flood water. As on, on that same day where I took that photograph, I saw a fuel bull desperately swimming for its life, trying to find shelter in these kind of bits of tusky grass that are just, just showing up. So it's easy pickings for um gulls and herons and uh, uh, other creatures. Uh, for the field voles, you know, it's, it's a bit of a disaster and they've really got to, to flee for their, for their lives. And, and floodplains, it's a natural release valve. Uh, uh, we need floodplains. For some reason, builders like to build in floodplains. Never a good idea, but uh, we really do need floodplains. because It's a re relief valve. And of course, in spring and summer, the, the hawk, the meadows here are full of flowers such as cuckoo flower, which attracts orange tip butterflies. Um, so it, it kind of spreads nutrients. It kind of um, um, uh, benefits nature in so many ways and, and it replenishes the, um, the pools and the oxbow, oxbow lakes that are on the, on the floodplain on, on the hawk, uh, which benefits amphibians and, and uh, birds such as snipe. The downside is, of course, there'll be um, Himalayan balsam seed in amongst there, so it's spreading that uh, uh, that problem uh, fuller down the river system. So there's um, swings and roundabouts, I suppose. And I mentioned, I mentioned the, the pools on the on the on the Hoch. Uh, lots of teal wind winter there. They they, they love the, pool, the pools there. Uh, and it's probably one of my favourite experiences is to go down to the uh, the Hoch between Dollar and Tillicucci on uh, at dusk on a, on a winter's night, and you just listen to the teal whistling to each other as as they fly in, and um, and they have this kind of contact call where they keep in touch with one another. Uh, very very attractive ducks. So um, moving on, and the next chapter of my, my book, is, um, I was getting my first sighting of uh, otters, and this is by an area of Willow Carr. So this picture wasn't taken at the end of the year, but this is a picture I, I took later in another otter counter. Um, but this area of Willow Carr, it really fascinated me because it was like the river creating a uh, new landscape and um, a new environment. So here it is, so it's a stretch of the river and when I first uh, moved to Dollar, first moved to Clamp Manager, and the very far right of the river, that's where the river was. So it was just like a, a, a flowing true and straight, and then it sort of took a left-hand bend. And then a series of flood events occurred. Uh, the river flooded, it created a shingle bar, and um, then it flooded again, the shingle bar moved, and another shingle bar was created, and it flooded some more. Erosion happened, um, and hey presto, we ended up with this huge um, uh, pool uh, a lovely natural pool that was never there before. So the pool is it's a area, a great area uh, for for fish. Uh, young fish like to like to be there. It's, it's like a nursery, and on the shingle um, banks that are created, willows start to colonise it. And in, into the sediment, the willow uh, was colonising, and it's fascinating because you see the young willow stems coming up, and then it acts as a trap. So every time the river floods, uh, sediment gets stuck in, in the in the sort of forest of willow stems. So it attracts uh, it attracts more leaves and um, more detritus, more twigs, and that kind of just builds up soil. So you're kind of building up a new land, a, a new landscape. So this river kind of creating um, new life, a new environment. Um, so it's a very dynamic river, and I think that's the great thing about rivers. Um, they, they never stand still. The, the river is is as alive as anything that actually lives uh, within it. So it's a, a very fascinating area, and I still love to visit that part of the of the Devon. And of course, this kind of areas of scrub that's now created attracts birds such as sedge warblers uh, in the spring and summer. So down on the the, the floodplain, you know, I mentioned you know the uh, how the the pools are replenished, uh, particularly in uh, autumn and early winter when the river goes into flood, and you always get the odd surprise. 
Now, this is a great white egret. So this is in December uh, 2019. Little, little egrets, a, a smaller cousin there, colonizing uh, England in big style. I've, uh, I've been down in England a lot uh, recently. I'm, I'm writing a new book on, on a, a British wildlife journey. Uh, and little egrets are everywhere. And you see them in Scotland a lot as well, uh, at skin flats in, near the Concarton bridges, you see a lot of little egrets. This guy was a bit of a surprise. Uh, it's a great white egret. Um, and they're, they too are expanding the range. And in and, and English travels, I've seen great white egrets in a, a couple of occasions this year uh, in the RSPB nature reserves. Um, so, so they're spreading their wings, possibly because of global warming, but I think also because um, a lot's down to conservation work. Um, there's a lot of great conservation work, you know, building reserves, building new, uh, preserving, conserving wetlands, and that's helping birds such as great egrets uh, expand their range. And cattle egrets as well are colonizing England. So I imagine, you know, the great white egret could be a bird we might see more of in central Scotland in the, in the years to come. Quite a tame bird, this one actually. Uh, um, it was much, there, was a, there was a heron nearby which flew off my approach, but the, uh, the great white egret liked to strut its stuff. It didn't seem to mind my presence at all. And then, so moving uh, into, um, uh, I better watch my time. Uh, how, how much longer have we got, Roy? Sure, that's fine. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go slightly faster. So I'm, I'm going a bit slower than I attended. So, so, so moving into, into winter time now, and uh, down at Canvas, uh, one of Roy's favourite places, and you know, fantastic place for geese. Uh, and you can't beat being down at Canvas at dusk. And you just hear the the grey lags and the pink feeted geese uh, flighting in, um, uh, moving to the roosts. It's a really, you know, it's a call, the wild call of the Arctic. I just absolutely love it. It's, it's just a, a very nice place to be. Very wild, very incongruous place, Canvas, because you know there's there's a sign of uh, humanity all around. You know, there's the Diageo um, whiskey warehouses, and then across there's uh, the old munitions depots uh, 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 on the other side of the fourth. So uh, back and I like that incongruous. In Group gruity, you know how nature and, and people can live side by side. It's something you know maybe compelling about that. And grey seals, uh, you get them sometimes at canvas. Uh, you most often get them in September, October, attracted by the salmon and sea trout and moving into river that are moving up upstream to, to spawn. I suspect the weir at canvas actually uh, benefits the uh, the seals because that uh, the salmon will, will kind of congregate below the weir before they try to negotiate it. So I imagine that might uh, deliver some easy pickings for a, a, a grey seal. I've actually seen porpoises off canvas as well, and um, that, that's another story. I think one of them was, was ill, uh, and that's why um, they were so far up, up the river. And our teal, teal or the, which you saw a picture of earlier, teal are the main bird um, that, that you get in the river, but you, you get a few golden eyes as well. Um, and you can see why the golden eye is so called, a very apt name. So in my river year now is kind of moving in, into sort of early spring uh, or late winter, February time. These are hazel catkins at, uh, at Rumbling Bridge. Uh, it's just a, a great time. That now the river's really coming to life. I think you know, uh, springtime. It's my favourite time time of, of the year. It's just always a great time to be. Um, the catkins are coming out. Willow, um, hazel catkins, um, alders, um, alder catkins as well are coming out. The the alder is the quintessential riverside tree. So so important. Um, you know, its uh, it, its roots help bind the banks. You know, help prevent erosion. Its roots. Have that uh, reef effect. That, that reef effect is talking about you know, hiding places for fish and for, for invertebrates. Uh, and the, the, they have the ability to fix nitrogen, to, to kind of improve the soil, to, uh, to fertilize the soil. So it's a kind of pioneer tree that can you know, colonize boggy areas and that other, other trees and other plants can benefit from, from later. Yeah, so this is. Um, uh, well, sort of later chapters in my book, I, I talk a bit about the Industrial Revolution and how it impacted on River Devon. Uh, and it was a very traumatic period uh, for the river. So this had been in the um, late 18th and the 19th century. Um, the, the burns, uh, the, the steep burns that tumbled down from the, the very steep scarp of the Ocals, I mean, they've always been important for people for providing water. But, you know, towards the, the, the 18th and 19th century, people realised that it could be harnessed for power. And of course, these burdens were harnessed for power for, for textile mills. And, you know, the, the, this was the dawn of industry, the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. 
And the populations of the, the Hillfoot villages along there, of Tillicutri, of Alva, of Menstry, they grew tremendously. I think something like in, in 1750, the population of Tillicutri was five to 600 people. A hundred years later, it was uh, well over 5,000 people. So huge, huge changes, huge pressure on the, on the river, um, even just from, from raw sewage, from, from human waste, you know, kind of neutrifying the river and uh, creating algae, which kind of uh, depletes oxygen. That was causing problems. And of course, there's all the, the direct pollution that was coming from the, uh, the mills. And this was happening even up until the 1950s and 1960s. Um, there's anglers I, I knew who used to fish the river then, and they could tell what dye was being used in the mills because if the river Devon or Alva or Menstry was yellow, they were using yellow dye. If it was purple at Tillicutri, they were using purple dye. Um, so it's a dreadful time for the river. Uh, it, it really was dreadful. Uh, but thankfully, you know, the river has um, it, it's cleaned up a lot and new legislation uh, has helped clean it up. And of course, the, the mills uh, now have gone. So it's just, just a nice scene of how it looks now, uh, a lot cleaner, a lot healthier. But, but there still is, um, uh, sadly, there still are pollution problems in, in the river. Um, I find it astonishing. There, here's a sewage outfall pipe at Tillicutri. You know, here we are in the 21st century and we're using Victorian solutions of how to get rid of our sewage. Now, these pipes are not used all the time. They tend to be used when it's been really heavy rainfall and, and, uh, and to prevent the sewage sort of backing up in the system, uh, uh, sewage is actually released into the river. Um, which is, you know, it's, it's not a good thing to do, but it still happens. Um, and uh, uh, there are all kinds of uh, directives and targets to, to try and improve this, but whether that ever happens is, is going to be a different story. Uh, and, and plastic, of course, is, is another problem. You know, this is uh, near Tillicutri. It's depressing after a, a heavy flood when you see how much plastic there is adorning the trees and the uh, uh, like Christmas tree decorations. It, it's, it's absolutely everywhere. And that was, you know, struck home to me, even in the remotest places. Here's me after I've been snorkeling in, in Sky in, in, in Vatranish uh, a few years ago. And you came out the water. So this is a very remote part of Sky, you know, a uh, remote peninsula. And then look at all the, the, the plastic rubbish, the, uh, the derby there. If I'm holding a, uh, let's say, a milk bottle and a lid or something. And there's uh, fishing rope debris. And I think there's fish farm debris uh, uh, there behind as well. Um, so a really major problem. Um, and when, when I was just uh, down in uh, Spurn Point in, in the East Riding of, of Yorkshire just a few weeks ago, uh, researching my new book, um, and there was plastic cups all over uh, Spurn Point, which is a, it's a spit, a peninsula. And I worked out these plastic cups are all the same. They must have been coming from the Hull ferries that were going from Hull to Zeebrugge or Hull to Hooker Holland. So people were just having a uh, diner, coffee, 10 minute fix, have a drink, chuck it over the side. You know, a, a ten minute bit of pleasure, and you've got a problem for hundreds of years getting stacked up. So it's, uh, um, you know, there still needs to be a big change in our mindset and and, and how we, we live our lives. I went looking for water voles um, on the Devon. Didn't find any. Sadly, they did occur there. Anglers have told me they saw them up to the eighties. So presumably mink um, have been a problem there. Um, but I was lucky. A, a, a few years ago. Uh, I was lucky enough to see a water vole reintroduction scheme um, in Lockhart Forest in the, in the Trossachs, um, where they've been sort of reintroduced around the Ducre water. And there they've been able to control the mink because the, the Ducre water is, is, is in a, a, a basin uh, in the hills, so it's easy to control. And they've reintroduced water voles uh, there, and they're, they're doing really well. Um, you do get uh, some water voles in the, Dev in the River Devon area, and they tend to be on the, on the pools um, away from the main bit of the river. So moving into spring, you know, again, the, the pools and the hawk, talking about great places for frogs, very important, uh, uh, how it's re re replenishing um, uh, the wildlife there. So now we're into March, coming to the end of, of my river year. And I think this is one of the areas that uh, kind of struck me, you know, how rivers are really important to us, because they are places of, of relaxation and um, make the mind feel better. Because this it was March 2022, uh, 2020, sorry, and of course, then we were approaching the coronavirus lockdown. So, and I remember so clearly, it was just like two or three days before the, before the lockdown, um, and the river was suddenly busy with people. Um, and we knew, everyone knew there was some calamity approaching us. We didn't know what it's going to be like, how bad it was going to be. But it's like people were seeking solace in nature. They were coming out, and I suppose shops were closing then and, and, and whatnot. So there weren't so many things to do uh, otherwise than to be out and actually enjoy the countryside. And I remember that so very clearly. Here is a, a long-tailed tit's nest 
um, I found uh, just right by the river and, you know, very inspiring, you know, thousands of feathers and lichens and mosses have gone to make this kind of uh, uh, dome shaped nest. Um, and it was just kind of that kind of um, inspirational feel, you know, how nature is good for our, our um, good for our mental health and how rivers are good for our mental health. And that kind of really struck me um, just before the, the coronavirus uh, lockdown. And as we as we move into spring, you know, beauties like Lesser Celandine, um, they start sprouting by, by the river bank. And therein lies another benefit of rivers, because rivers are corridors, they're corridors of life. And often they are corridors of ancient woodland because they haven't been farmed right up to the river's edge. And there are strips of ancient woodland that haven't been touched. And flowers like Lesser Celandine and um, um, wooden enemies, uh, again, by River Devon, these are indicators, you know, of, of long undisturbed woodlands. Um, and so, and the act is corridors, because uh, not so rivers are just not corridors for fish and underwater creatures. Uh, birds and bats can go up and down um, uh, these corridors of trees and and move to uh, new and different areas. And of course, the river's reach is all encompassing. It's not just a the river. There's the the burns, the tributaries. So if the river's an artery, you've got all these capillaries that just stretch all out over the landscape. So the, the reach of the river is everywhere. The reach of the river is, um, uh, as I say, is all encompassing. It, it is huge. Um, and uh, Ramsden's wild garlic, you know, another typical riverside plant. On the hawk on the flood meadows, the uh, the, the lapwings will move in in, in springtime. Sadly, I haven't really seen the lapwings the last couple of years. The, the population is really uh, taking a, a, a tumble, uh, which, which is a shame because they're such charismatic birds and have the most amazing uh, uh, courtship flight where they fly around like a crazy kite. Like a crazy out of controlled kite where you know, the male is displaying uh, uh, to, the, to the female. And then just before the coronavirus lockdown, uh, I knew I couldn't uh, really travel then. So I went down to Alva to pick up last of my trail cameras, my, uh, which are monitoring beavers. And won't well, the tide, yeah, I saw a beaver. Uh, so th this is at dawn, end of March uh, by Alva. Um, and there it was swimming up the river. Uh, all excited uh, as a geek I am, uh, so I was kind of following it. And um, I, sadly, I got too close. I mean, my first rule of wildlife watching is don't disturb what you're watching. Um, but I must confess, I maybe got too close. Um, and the beaver panicked and it splashed the water of its tail, a huge thumping splash. Uh, and that's a warning to other beavers. You know, there's some idiot around um, um, uh, uh, threatening us. Um, uh, so the beavers can hear that noise, that splashing noise they make. But look at that magnific magnificent paddle tail. I mean, they really are um, uh, incredible creatures. And uh, the willow car, that, that oasis of, of, of willow I mentioned about, um, here, here's a heron in it uh, feeding in the springtime. I initially thought it was a Neil his heron was, was eating and I posted the picture on Twitter or Facebook and uh, some a friend of mine came back to me and said, no, I think that's a brook lamprey. And he's right, it is a brook lamprey. Uh, and brook lampreys are very primitive fish, um, uh, perhaps not even a fish at all because they don't have true jaws, they've got cartilaginous skeletons. And, and these guys, these brute lampreys, they live as larvae in the sediment in the mud for two or three years, uh, and they turn into brute lampreys into adults in the springtime after two, three, four years. Uh, they quickly spawn and then they die. They, they spawn on gravel beds and then they die. They don't even feed as adults. You also got river lampreys um, in River Devon, uh, which do feed, and they're bigger, and, and they tend to migrate down to the down to the estuary uh, to feed before they return back to the river to spawn. And that area of Willow Car, that area, that pool you saw created, you know, toads have colonized the area, you know, toads breeding in the river. Um, toads go about breeding with a, a, a zeal that borders on the unhealthy, I think. Um, and I think the poor chap or chapess at the bottom is probably uh, in its final death throes after uh, being constr con uh, constricted. But it's amazing you know, to see how the river has created this habit. The ri river has created this, this pool uh, that, that toads live in. And sandpipers uh, appearing in spring. You had two waves of sandpipers. The first wave appears in early April. These are ones passing through, uh, going heading fuller north. And then the, the, the residents, the summer resident uh, uh, sandpipers, they arrive a week or two later. And goosanders who have the uh, real endearing habits of uh, carrying their youngsters on, on their back. And a bit like the number 23 bus, you see one beaver. Another beaver comes along. So I was, I was starting to see more beavers and I was getting some more in tune uh, with the river. So this, this is uh, an animal up by Duller. So they haven't really colonized the Duller area for upstream to any great extent. So I suspect this is a young animal. As maybe some uh, young animals after two years, they tend to leave the, the family territory and they start to explore new, uh, just new areas to colonize, new, new areas. 
And bats, the river is very important for bats. This is a, a soprano pipistrel bat. I know it's a soprano pipistrel because I had a bat detector and it's got a certain frequency, 55 uh, kilohertz, whereas the, the common pipistrel has got a lower um, uh, frequency. An amazing thing, uh, and soprano pipistrels have a real affinity with rivers. Uh, they prefer to be by water. And it's amazing how, you know, it was only in the 1980s that was discovered that the main pipistrel bat in Scotland actually consisted of two species. So we're finding new species of mammal in Britain in the 1980s. You know, what else is out there in uh, other parts of the world? The Dementins bat is the other uh, sort of main river species that you get in the River Devon, um, and they often kind of swarm under bridges and seen um, quite a lot. So now we're reaching the, the year ends. Um, so I wanted to finish the year sort of just exploring the, the, the Devon estuary a bit more. This is a shell dock in one of the ephemeral pools uh, on the other side of the river for, uh, from the canvas pools uh, on the eastern side of the river. Um, down in the canvas pools, uh, sat there one afternoon and this uh, uh, water rail came up, very attractive bird, uh, really quite tame, was quite happy to, to come close to me, um, which, which was good. Uh, as I've seen here at the River Devon um, in, in summer, so I wanted to go snorkeling in, in the river, in the estuary, I was, I was mad keen to go snorkeling. Um, but I kind of had uh, two rules. Um, one, I had to be at low tide, uh, so I could get you know, really close to the bottom, the river wasn't too deep. The other one was, I didn't want people to see a middle-aged man wearing a rubber suit, going through his midlife crisis, snorkeling, snorkeling in the river. So, so, so I made sure I did that about five o'clock in the morning when there's uh, not many walkers going, going past. Uh, and before I went snorkeling, just turning over snow uh, uh, stones on, on the mud, mud flats. So these are horse leeches. Um, they don't feed on blood. They, they kind of prey on, on other creatures or scavenge uh, on dead creatures. But they're very much a freshwater creature, uh, uh, the horse leech, which just, just shows you know, how fresh the environment is on the River Devon estuary. The River Devon estuary is it's an estuary that flows into an estuary, flows into the inner forest estuary. So when I was snorkeling um, and also turning up the stones, I was finding a lot of uh, these fellas, uh, uh, they're amphipods, a type of shrimp, uh, and it's, um, I asked uh, somebody from Bug Life what, what these were, uh, and he thinks they're brackish water shrimps, very different from the freshwater shrimps you get in the main part of the river, but there's lots of them, they're really, really common. And, and this, this is what the, the teal and the shell duck and um, other uh, waterfowl are feeding on uh, on the River Devon. So, so while the estuary uh, is not uh, hugely biodiverse, there's not a lot of different species, there's a, a large number of a few species, uh, which makes it uh, quite rich feeding. Here's a flounder, and the other thing I noticed uh, with a stock in the river, um, uh, as I said, I don't really recommend stock in an estuary, it's, it stinks, it's muddy, uh, the visibility is about two inches. So I was scrabbling around, but there are lots and lots of uh, juvenile flounders. This picture I didn't take in River Devon because uh, it's very clear. It's, a, it's an adult flounder that I took in the, a picture near Kings Barnes uh, in the East Nuke of Fife. So there, there are lots of baby flounders there, and they're just scooting ahead uh, uh, right in, in, in front of me. Um, and, and someone just mentioned to me at the start, they have been watching a great crested grebe catching young flounders uh, on the River Devon. Um, and, and so it kind of finally shows how important our rivers are, because the estuaries, they can be nursery grounds for fish, sometimes commercially important fish species. Uh, and that's why we know we need to kind of protect and look after our rivers. Yeah, so that's kind of... Uh, uh, so a whistle stop tour of uh, a year, wildlife year in the River Devon. Um, I hope you enjoy the talk and be more than happy to take any questions if anyone's had any questions. Right, well, I'm sure we've got some questions. Have we? Hold on, can you? So people at home can hear. Right. Back in 2020, people around Dollar were doing stuff about the Himalayan balsam, but they only seem to do it for one year and it's all coming back again. Are there any plans to continue sorting it out? Yeah, I, I, I've been involved in that as well. And that's like a kind of a community initiative. I think I might be on, this, on the same um, um, uh, uh, trip that you, that you were on, uh, removing the, uh, uh, balsam from the, the River Devon. Um, it has gone for, I did go in last year, I think, or the year before. So I've, I've been, I've done it twice. And it has actually made an, an effect. And it, it's just simply, you're, you're pulling out balsam by, by its roots. 
Uh, and this is about, uh, for memory, it's about June time, isn't it, or, or early July. Uh, so it does work, but it's, it's really labour intensive and you've got to keep on doing it and keep on doing it. It is coming back. It, it is. Uh, and, and that's a problem. Um, it's, it's, it's a major problem. And uh, Japanese knotweed is, is uh, potentially just as big a problem uh, happening. So, I mean, so community power, people doing what you suggest is good. But if you stop it for a year or two years, it just, uh, it, it does come back. So, yeah, it's, it's a problem, a big, big problem of rivers. We had a problem in canvas pools with it and uh, did some experiments, different ways to do, treat it. The best is actually to use Roundup. You can't really pull the plants out of hedgerows and things like that. You just can't get to them. And uh, of course you can spray them quite easily. Any more questions? Any idea if the relative number of otters and mink, because supposedly they don't stick on. <laughs> True. I, I, I would say there's fewer mink in the river now and, and, and more otters, um, but that's anecdotal. Um, I don't really, I don't fish much now anymore. I used to fly fish a lot on the river, and when I did, I'd say a lot of mink. Um, so it's, it's kind of hard to be for sure, but um, I would say the river at its maximum carrying capacity for otters, I mean, uh, um, you don't see otters a lot, but you see lots of signs for them. And when I put trail cameras down, um, I always catch otters, and, uh, catch otters in the camera, and you see their sprints on, um, on tree stumps and, and grassy hummocks. So I suspect uh, the otters are doing better uh, just now, and uh, the mink are suffering to a degree. Um, but that's anecdotal, I can't say that for certain. Uh, but the mink are still there, they're, they're, they're definitely still there. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, we've got a question online here asking uh, about dead trees in the Devon. Um, is it now a thing that dead trees can stay in the river? Um, Gabby, who used to work here, said they were always trying to convince people of the wildlife value, um, but people always wanted to fish them out. Yeah, no, I mean that, that's a really good question. Uh, and for example, the, the local angling association on the River Devon, uh, they spent the work parties used to spend all their life removing trees from from the river. Um, and their thinking was, a tree falls in the river, it could impede uh, salmon and trout migrating. Um, but people I've talked to, people in the Fourth Rivers Trust, you know, a lot of the scientists, they've never ever come across a river that's been completely blocked by a tree. There's always ways through it, under, through, um, or over. You know, a, a fish can can, can even uh, uh, go over. And the thinking now is, uh, um, is, is daft to remove a tree from a river. It's, it's a lot of unnecessary work. Uh, trees, as I mentioned in the talk, um, that fall in the river, they, they're like underwater reefs. They, they support fish, they support invertebrates. Uh, they can feed the river um, and they can impede the flow. They, they can slow flooding down. Um, uh, so trees are, are really, really important. And that's how rivers have been managing themselves for since the dawn of time. And salmon haven't come extinct because they can't get up rivers because of fallen trees. Because um, they've always had that problem and they've always negotiated it. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll finish with the last question. Uh, when I was down at Camus Pools once, the angling, uh, Devon Angling Association, is it called? They were down in boat, boats. Uh, looking at the fish below weir in canvas, so that would be uh, saline, and they had sparling, which I think sparling is quite a rare fish, isn't it? And their spawning grounds are in uh, these sorts of estuaries. Uh, is anything, are they protected or? Yeah, I, I, again, that's, that's a really interesting point, because um, in my work at the Fourth Rivers Trust, um, um, the, the trust, for example, concentrates all its work on the rivers, uh, quite rightly, because that's what they do. But the remit also includes the fourth estuary. And to me, that's the most biodiverse area of the whole fourth system. And we don't really know what's there. Uh, Sparling, there's uh, three populations in Scotland. There's a population in the fourth, there's a population in the Solway, and there's a population on the, on the Tay. Uh, but we don't, we know a bit about, about the Solway population, but the population in the fourth we know very little about. Uh, and the Devon is a classic river where they could spawn. If, if no one uh, knows about the sparring life cycle, it kind of lives in uh, estuaries, like sea estuaries, like first, first or fourth Solway. Uh, and then in March time, uh, they'll enter a river en masse and, and spawn in the lower reaches. 
um, the weir obviously would be a, a problem for them uh, at Canvas. Um, but I'd love to research whether there are spawning sparling in, in the in the Devon. And I think there's a very good chance. Um, and I'm sure I recall perhaps um, some article or scientific article I've read even the fourth natural historian that you know, the long Annet power station would be catching sparling in the yeah. in the in the water intake pipes, you know, in the grills there as well, lots of sprats. Um, so, you know, the inner fourth estuary, not just the, where the Devon is, um, it could be a real Aladdin's cave of stuff, which we don't actually really know about. So uh, that's why I'm working hard to try and get the Fourth Rivers Trust to get involved and even just do some kind of sampling program for the types of fish that occur in the, in the inner fourth, because uh, it will may well be commercially important. Uh, you get a lot of sprats in the inner fourth, for example, um, and they feed seabirds off the Bass Rock and, you know, other times of the year. So it's, uh, yeah. Um, so there's a lot to discover, uh, definitely, and you know, a very interesting topic. Well, when I was down at Canvas, I met a couple of really old guys uh, who lived at Canvas all their lives. And they were saying what a wonderful success story clearing the Devon up has been. They said as young boys, they used to have to go up to Tillicoutry to catch any fish the whole of the river and the fourth too uh, was dead as far as fish were concerned. There was no oxygen in the river fourth uh, from Canvas down to uh, Alawa at all for several months of the year. So there are some real success stories. Uh, not everything about nature is negative and cleaning up the Devon. They told me that the, uh, the Devon was so full of sewerage and dyes from all the dye works and everything else that when it went out into the fourth which was totally dead and full of all this stuff you could still see the plume of the river uh, created by the river Devon going downstream where it was actually much more polluted than the fourth if that's unbelievable but uh, a major clear up job so thank you very much for a most interesting talk the books are going to be on sale here in a minute. Yes. <laughs> and thank you very much. Well, I, I'm not sure if I've got time, but uh, I put together some slides of what we've done in the last uh, month. There it is. Uh, I won't have time to do all of this, but I've asked people to contribute these slides, so I must show them, I think. So you know that we've got a planning team in the... Um, in the are we ready to deal with this? Yep. We have a planning team uh, on our committee, and I asked the lady who runs this, uh, Liz Alberts, if she put together something about what the planning team have been doing in the last month. Well, the, there's quite a lot to, uh, to read here, but I'll quickly summarize it. Uh, they have the major application that they've had in is to do with the forestry grant uh, for the woodlands uh, in this area called the Demiatus State, which um, is going to be, has been brought up and uh, it's going to be, some areas are going to be reforested and she's been looking at the planning application and she's absolutely glowing. So we've got somebody here uh, from the company that's associated with this. So he'll be the person that blushes when he hears what uh, uh, Liz had to say about it. This is very unusual and she's very damning. Um, uh, where does it say it? At uh, first look, this recent proposal is the best surveyed, most diligently prepared and the most diversity friendly proposal I've ever seen in nine years of doing this. So uh, looks like <laughs> that's good news for getting the grant. And we're very lucky to have a company like this. Now, we've been working with them. Uh, this is the area that they're dealing with. I mustn't point, of course. Uh, but uh, you can see down in the left-hand corner here is the Logie Kirkyard and uh, over the other side there you can see Menstry. Um, <clears throat> we've been working with university students. We've been given an area where there's going to be experimental 
uh, conservation in the bottom left hand corner and I had some slides the students have been growing up uh, plants to plant out there the whole of this area had sheep in it and they've grazed it down many of the natural plants that should be there uh, um, are not I haven't got the change can you change it for me thanks yeah there we are so these are the students they've been growing uh, up sticky catch fly for instance uh, since last March and in the autumn here we've uh, been planting it out uh, this is an area of woodland that they've been uh, planting out uh, Silene dioica red campion but farther next slide on the slopes they've been planting out sticky catch fly this very rare plant uh, that should be found here but isn't found actually in this place because it's so, been so heavily grazed. Before they can actually plant the plant out we've got to get rid of the gorse otherwise it will smother the plant so uh, that's what they're doing just here. Next slide. Uh, two weeks later the same group of students they wanted they've read the book by Sheldrake on um, can't, I can never remember the name of it something to do with the web yeah, that's right. Entangled life. Sorry, that's what it's about. It's all about the fungi in uh, woodlands and that's inspired them. And they asked me if they could get if I could get hold of some people to teach them about fungi. And luckily I went to the Dundee group of the SWT and this chap on the left hand end is a, a really good mycologist. Uh, and he and Helen, who you may have seen, comes to some of our meetings from Car King Cardin, I uh, took the students round. We were very lucky because about a week and a half ago we couldn't find any fungi and I was going to call off the uh, the event but within that week hundreds thousands of fungi came up so that when we went out in the university woods it was very hard not to step on them. The next slide uh, we were lucky because the university have got some disused greenhouses and we were able to use these uh, to take the uh, fungi back and look them up in the textbooks as you can see here. We've got a wonderful display. One that I really took my imagination is the next slide. Uh, this was found by Helen. Now this is a piece of grass and at the top of it doesn't look like fungi. In fact it's not. This is the remains of an earwig. Can you see it's uh, pincers at the back but it's been infected by a fungus. Now these fungi produce spores and the spores if they get on the uh, body of the uh, the earwig uh, they will grow in through the exoskeleton and get into what's called the hemocele that's a, a, a liquidy uh, area blood-like area in the middle of the earwig and it grows there and the fungus then grows into the brain of the earwig and affects the earwig and it starts to want to grow upwards. <laughs> it put Darwin off in religion actually this uh, sort of story. Anyway the a fungus gets into the brain of the earwig, it grows up, it has this compulsion to go upwards and if it's near a stem it will go up to the top it then clamps itself onto the stem with its jaws up at that end and all its uh, legs twirl around the um, uh, the uh, the stem and it dies and then the fungus takes over the fungus takes over the hemocele grows out through the skin and produces spores and they're, because they're held up high they disperse very easily so fungi are absolutely fascinating been a lot of medical research done on these things actually as well. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> right now these are um, the those are some of the things that we've done anyway in the last month but these are coming up events which I've been asked to advertise. The calendar local group have got a talk on the translocation of beavers to Argety red kites. They've got beavers there now too and that's on Thursday the 10th at 7.30 St Andrew's Church Hall in Canada. Next one, this is the fourth naturalist and historian, their annual one day uh, meeting. Uh, it's a mixture of uh, hist history papers and wildlife papers and the wildlife uh, 
presentations. There's going to be one on the woodland that I was just telling you about on uh, Demiat. Uh, there's a paper, uh, there's a talk on the um, the pearl water fritillary in the Trossachs. There's then going to be one about the impact of uh, power state, uh, wind power turbines, wind turbines on uh, bird kill by Ken Duffy. And in the at the end here, Melissa, who's one of the members of our committee, uh, she's going to give a talk on heat and bog restoration on the Slamanum Plateau. So that's a good thing. Uh, we've got some students here today. Students go to that tree. And uh, so we hope you turn up. Right, and the journal for the fourth naturalist and historian is also kind of come out of this conference. And with relationship to today's talk, there is a paper by Drew uh, Janison on uh, salmon in the fourth catchment. And it deals with uh, the numbers, etc. Next pa next one. Uh, I was asked to talk about TWIC. TWIC stands for the Wildlife Information Centre. Uh, it's got its annual conference in Edinburgh, and it's going to talk. The subject is migratory organisms. Next one. Our next talk uh, is going to be on Tuesday the 6th of December in here and it's going to be on uh, given by David Trudgell. Uh, I know him from the Hardy Orchid Society. When he retired he bought some fields, he's an agronomist actually, and he bought some fields and tried to convert them into a orchid uh, meadow and that's not as easy as you think but he's actually got 15 different sorts of orchids uh, growing in this meadow. It also is an SSSI and he has trouble with beavers on it. It's an old water mill. So it should be an interesting talk, uh, I think. Right, I think that that's the last of the talks. And here, thanks to Chris at the front. We're very lucky in having Chris as chairman, not only because he's a very good chairman, but also because he comes with lots of equipment and uh, uh, a lot of the stuff that we're using today to transmit this uh, talk uh, comes from Caledonian Conservation, uh, the uh, company he is director of. So thank you uh, very much. I think that's it.